Anyway, um, so why did I write on learning liberty? Uh, my, my background is I'm a, I'm a First Amendment lawyer. Um, I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment work. Um, that's considered kind of weird. <laughs> um, not many people go to law school specifically to do First Amendment work. I got laughed at sometimes for it. I took every class that Stanford Law School offered on constitutional law, and I even did six additional credits on early origins of censorship during the Tudor dynasty. I remember explaining this project to one of my friends, um, and he looked at me in horror, saying, who's making you do that? And realizing that my passion for, for the First Amendment was, and free speech was, was different than other people. Um, but despite this, despite the fact that I went to Stanford Law School, um, the fa despite the fact that I worked for the ACLU of Northern California, I was not prepared for the kind of cases I would see on college campus. I was simply not prepared for it. And I've been doing this now for 11 years. Um, and there was a time when free speech on campus was considered a serious issue that should transcend party lines. But now it's barely noticed in the media. Um, and, uh, and worst of all, when people hear about free speech incidents on campus, the first question they ask is, what is the politics uh, as a way of finding out whether or not they can care or not? Um, it's a sign of the culture wars that this is an issue that I believe has been uh, largely dismissed. Um, I wrote this book in part to address why I think, um, I, I got, started receiving this very creepy question from different people interested in the book. And you know, I, I, we'd have these weekly outrages, these ridiculous cases going on where students got in trouble for, in some cases, really quite tame speech. And after a while, people started asking me, well, okay, fine. Campuses, are, they overreact, people get in trouble, but why does this matter? And uh, as I said to some of you earlier tonight, I found this question deeply chilling. There was a time when there was it was obvious and there was no question that free speech on college campuses matters. But I wanted to write on learning liberty with the goal of explaining how it matters to people even once they're not on campus um, and how it affects uh, the way the country itself uh, t t talks within itself. So I went looking for, for data about um, some patterns uh, about the way, uh, about American attitudes about free speech on campus. And this is a very large study. This is the American Association of Colleges and Universities. It's 24,000 students and 9,000 campus professionals. It just came out um, in 2010, uh, very, a very extensive study. And they asked the milk toast question, is it safe to hold unpopular positions on campus? Now, if you're asking that kind of question, what you're doing is your PR firm is looking for a whitewash question to say, well, of course it's safe to hold unpopular points of view on campus. Um, they're not asking if it's safe to talk about it. It's not, they're not asking if it's safe to take that position. It's not asking if it's safe to say to your friends. It's just saying, just merely hold. So this is a question that was designed to get everyone to, to, to send a signal to the entire society Everything's fine on campus, folks, nothing to see here. They didn't quite get the answer they were expecting. Only 40% of high school, of, of college freshmen strongly agreed with the statement that it's safe to hold unpopular points of view on, on campus. Um, that's miserable. Uh, and if you'll notice, as it goes, uh, as they go up in seniority, their belief that it's safe to hold um, unpopular points of view on campus goes down. By the time you're a senior, um, it's only 30%. And most tellingly, campus professionals, which include um, uh, administrators and also professors, 18.7%. And within that number, 16.7%. Only 16.7% of professors surveyed strongly agree with the statement that it is safe to merely hold unpopular points of view on campus. So something's gone wrong. Um, and there's other things that, that have been screaming this out to the, to, to the public, including the silent classroom phenomenon. The silent classroom phenomenon was something that I read about first in the New York Times. And uh, 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 Michio Kakatani, um, who's sort of a feared literary critic, um, she wrote a piece about why don't students talk in class anymore. And apparently there's a whole literature about why students don't talk in class anymore. And I've been reading it now for years, but from the point of view of someone who's working to save student and faculty members' academic careers for things that they say in class. And never have I seen in this body of literature um, the suggestion that maybe they're a little more, bit more reticent about saying what, what their point of view is because they know there's at least a tiny chance they might get in trouble. 
They talk about, they, they brought up Oprah, they brought up Crossfire, they brought up um, Monica Lewinsky, all of these different theories on why students might be afraid of talking in class. And they also talked about a student who had written about this phenomena at UMass um, at the time that I had started fire, right around the time of 9-11. And what was amazing to me was the student who had written about this was questioning why everybody was so reticent. Meanwhile, fire had to intervene to, um, uh, to uh, after 9-11 to get UMass to allow there to be a 9-11 uh, march, to there to be an anti-terrorism march. And specifically, UMass had a rule against saying things that were considered disrespectful in class. Um, again, wildly overbroad. Of course, your professors have the right to control a classroom, but I think it was amazing that there was a sort of aphasia about the fact that, um, uh, that students could actually get in trouble. So, but one of the most interesting uh, uh, stats that I fell upon um, while, while doing the research for the book uh, goes to the very heart of what I'm saying. Censorship doesn't work. And what it does is it causes people to talk to the people they already agree with. This is why when you ask average students, they're not going to say that censorship is a major problem on campus. Because this is all you have to do. You talk to the people you already agree with. You don't disagree with your professors if you know they can't take it. And a lot of them can't. Um, and that you uh, join the groups that already uh, represent your ideology, religious beliefs, or whatever. Um, you do those three things, college is a breeze. But the problem with that is that that's exactly what's wrong with our entire society, and that we should expect more from higher education. We, we should expect it to teach people to talk, um, not just to talk, but to be able to seek out people across lines of differences, to try to figure out who they are, why they think what they do, um, and to see them, see them as people. Meanwhile, we're in, but when, anytime you create a risk of punishment, you're encouraging people to stay within their echo chamber. So one of the most, but one of the most powerful facts, one of the most powerful pieces of research that came out of, of, of my research for the book was that there's an inverse correlation between your level of education and how many people you talk to that you disagree with in an average uh, week or month. I found that fascinating. Um, that if you have a high school education, you tend to t talk to the most. If you have a college education, you talk to fewer. By the time you get to PhDs, you have the least disagreements. Um, now, there's something that can be kind of expected about this. It's nice to circle yourself with friends who all agree with you and that kind of stuff. And it's, and, and it's a little bit of human nature. But so much of education is about overcoming some of the worst parts of human nature. And to me, uh, the value of, 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 of being educated, a uh, well, way you can show it is to be that person who is dying to seek out the smart person they disagree with. Um, and that's not happening according to the, to, to the stats. Now, I've given some, some of the research that I think um, uh, 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 talks about why I'm concerned about this first. But if you don't know about the kind of cases I deal with, I'm just going to give some, some uh, quick-ish examples. But I have to spend a little bit of time on this one. OK, everybody calm down. I know this is a terrifying collage, um, but uh, I want to explain this. In, in 2007, Hayden Barnes, a student at uh, uh, Valdosta State University, a public college in, in uh, uh, southern Georgia, was protesting a parking garage complex. The parking garage complex uh, was $30 million, $15,000 per car. Um, and the student believed that there were also environment, more environmentally friendly ways of dealing with parking congestion on campus. But little did Hayden Barnes know that President Ronald Zachary um, had been defeated once before by environmentalists in getting this um, uh, parking garage project. And he wasn't going to let them do this again. And all of this, the, the, how deep this case ran came out in discovery, because this eventually became a lawsuit. And I knew this case was bad when we first got involved in it. But how deep this ran is, was incredible. So Hayden Barnes, he starts uh, writing letters. He starts sending emails um, to the Board of Regents to explain uh, that, uh, why he thinks that they don't, they don't need this parking garage project and alternatives. He writes a letter to the editor. I mean, like old-timey, civic, uh, civil, uh, old-fashioned kind of freedom of speech he, he's engaged in. But then he gets called into Ronald Zachariah's office, dressed down for how dare you, I can't trust you anymore, like this really weird passive-aggressive uh, thing going on between, uh, between him and the student. And after that, um, and, and a, in a show of defiance, <laughs> Hayden Barnes puts up this collage on Facebook. No blood for oil, crushed earth, smog, um, that's Ronald Zachary. And 
to make a joke about the fact that the university president had somewhat pathetically referred to this parking garage as part of his legacy, he called it the Save Zachariah Memorial Parking Garage. Uh, Save being the environmentalist group um, students uh, in, uh, that uh, at Valdosta that they believed had fallen down on the job. Um, and little did he know, again, that the university president had been having meetings. This is all documented. He, this is, I think this came out maybe the third meeting, fourth meeting, trying to figure out how I can kick out this student from, from my school. Um, and then by the third meeting, he found this. He said, ha, memorials are things that happen usually when you're dead. This is a threat upon my life. And I am kicking him out of school. Um, now, the other administrators were saying, you can't kick a student out of school because you don't like his point of view on a parking garage. He has due process. He has free speech rights. And while you know, I, I, I think it's good that they pushed back somewhat, they didn't stop the president from kicking out the student. Um, and if anybody has any inclination to think that Ronald Zachariah was genuinely scared for his life in this case, keep in mind that he slipped the note of expulsion under Hayden Barnes's door with this staple to it, saying that you are a clear and present danger to campus, which is adorable from a legal perspective, by the way, to say that, um, and that you have to be off campus in 48 hours. If you think someone is actually a life or death threat to your campus, you don't slip a note under his door telling him he has, he has to be off campus. Um, so, and also, the student, uh, he, uh, it, they, it said he had to get psychological evaluations. They, they made it really hard. He said he had to get two psychological evaluations. He immediately went out and got two psychological evaluations. Both of them saying, uh, this guy is not a harm to himself. This guy is a harm to nobody else. And by the way, he's a believer in Shambhala Buddhism, non-aggression, and a decorated EMT. You could have not picked a worse person to be picking on for this. But nonetheless, President Zachariah decided to die on this hill, and we've been fighting this case for a long time. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a bad case, and it's the case that I open up on Learning Liberty talking about, and it's a rich case, it's a crazy case. But as wacky and crazy as the case is, the most terrifying thing about the case is not a single student at Valdosta State University or professor at Valdosta State University came to the student's defense. He was kicked out for a collage and nobody gave a damn. And that's what I think is actually the more dangerous thing is, is, is the apathy about, about these cases. So to get to just a little bit of a, of a refresher on free speech, or wh why free speech matters, because I, I don't think that people uh, sometimes totally appreciate it. And I really have been trying to emphasize the fact that I think that even beyond the law, free speech is one of the great cultural innovations of all time. Um, it's an idea that you, can no, you no longer will be jailed for your opinions, and that things get settled uh, in debate and discussion as opposed to at the end of a sword. Um, it allowed for progress uh, of an unparalleled level, and I think it's been so successful that we have a tendency to take it for granted. And I think currently as a society, we take it very much for granted. People also forget that free speech is ultimately the protector of minority rights. Um, you don't need a separate amendment to protect majority rights in a democracy. Democracy protects the rights of a majority in a uh, 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 you need a, a special amendment to protect things that the, when, the min, when the majority wants to hurt the minority. That's the whole point of a lot of the Bill of Rights, is to say, listen, even if we decide that we want to vote away your point of view, we can't, except if you have a two-thirds majority and pass an amendment. But anyway, it's, it's almost impossible to get an anti-free speech amendment. Um, the, but ultimately, it's about protecting minority rights, about protecting oddballs, dissenters, those who have novel ideas, those that the world might not be ready for, for, for satirists, for prophets. I remember someone, and, and it's hard to really think of, of ways that you can not do havoc to the world um, by, li by limiting it in some way. I, I was talking at Goucher State University, and I had someone say, um, uh, say okay, I've got one, I've got, I've got one. This, this is definitely something you should be able to ban. Um, why can't you ban incoherent speech, speech that doesn't make sense? And, and I was like, Okay, and, and I was glad that this was the first thing that came to mind. Think about relativity. Think about being in 1850 and someone explaining relativity to you. Don't you think you'd be able to kick them out? I mean, like other than like Poincaré or like really unique people, you're not going to have someone who's gonna think that, that some of these, these theories that later proved to be true are anything but rubbish. So it's, it's a brilliant idea. And it also, uh, at its core, is incredibly humble. 
It's epistemological humility at its best. I'm not omniscient. I'm, I'm actually, that's one thing I can say I know. I know I'm not omniscient. And I have a guess that neither are you. <laughs> and free speech recognizes that. It recognizes that we're biased, that we tend to see our own beliefs as being fundamentally true, um, and, that we have, and, that, and that ultimately, you, since you have to put people in charge of deciding what you are and are not allowed to say, that it's best to tie their hands to not go into the realm of opinion. It's really a, quite a brilliant idea. Um, it produces creativity, um, dynamism, um, and it's possibly our best hedge against confirmation bias, but only if we use it. Now, the other part of it is I, I'm a lawyer. I, I, I love First Amendment law. That's what, what I went to law school to study. I mean, I love free speech first, and then I found there was a, a, a concept that embodied it. But joking aside, this is a cartoon from a 1973 Supreme Court case. It's called Papish. Um, it involved a student, Barbara Papish. She was angry that police that she believed had assaulted um, her, uh, her group. Her group, by the way, and there's some adult content in this, um, was called Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers. Um, uh, got off um, from uh, tra charges of police brutality. And she ran this cartoon that involves these cops raping the Statue of Liberty and the embodiment of justice. Harsh speech, uh, real speech, but on a deadly serious topic. And this, the Supreme Court saw, and when, um, and when they saw it, there was no hesitation. They said that it's absolutely absurd to say that speech can be limited on college campuses in the name of conventions of decency alone. They immediately understood that, yes, Higher education is about being engaged with the real world, and the real world can be really harsh sometimes. And if you're not ready for, harsh, uh, for, for, for some harsh speech, you might not be ready for college. And so this is protected. And the Supreme Court has been very clear and very strong on free speech. Um, and, the, uh, and since 1989, there have been more than a dozen suits against campus, lawsuit, uh, against campus speech codes, and every single time they've been defeated. Um, so, Law is incredibly clear. Must be an easy job for me, right? This is a book that celebrates the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. It's called Notre Dame versus the Klan. Uh, not everybody remembers that the Klan also hate, hated Catholics. They were pretty, you know, uh, uh, broad in their uh, in their point of view when it came to who they hated. Um, and they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. And this is a book that tells with some amount of delight how they got their asses handed to them when they marched on Notre Dame in 1924. Um, and there was a student at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, not Purdue, um, who was reading this book. He was a non-traditional age student. Um, he was reading the book, again, celebrates the defeat of the Klan. Not that that makes it less more or less protected, just makes it more ironic. He was found guilty of racial harassment without so much as a hearing. Um, and, he, and, it, and I've talked to this student a lot of times, and it's very pathetic to hear him explaining it. But I was trying to explain it wasn't a racist book. I was trying to actually you know, broaden my, my horizons. But because this cover was uh, experienced as offensive, that was enough. He was found guilty of reading a book on an aberrant racial topic. Um, again, with, without a hearing. So th this is the weird kind of parallel universe in which I live. Um, now, there's also the problem with overregulation. University administrators who believe that they can limit speech in a way that, well, frankly, they can't. Um, overregulation is a serious problem on college campuses, and I, I have this, this discussion in here because this just happened. Sinclair Community College in Ohio, um, sorry, they had a ban on signs. You're, you're not allowed to have protest signs anywhere. And when they were, uh, when, when people were trying to actually just hold up sticks that had things written on them that didn't have any signs on them, they were then told, no signage whatsoever. <laughs> You're not allowed to have ones that don't have, that aren't on sticks or even just posters that you carry. You have to put them away. This is a rule apparently, by the way, Sinclair College had had since the 1990s. But they were enforcing it in this case against a pro-life group. And that's, that's a cop actually busting someone for having a sign at Sinclair Community College. Sinclair Community College, we wrote them. We'd, we'd written them back in 2008, and we wrote them again after we sued them, um, and said, you know, this is, this is kind of unconstitutional, guys. And this is the argument that they made. Virginia Tech in 
their argument about why they should ban signs on campus is for because of Virginia Tech and 9-11. And this is one of the things that I worry about in, in, in the way we discourse amongst each other, is that it doesn't even occur to, to him, the, the, the president, I, don't, I can't believe he sincerely believed this, but there's something just wrong about invoking something so serious to, uh, to excuse a ban that has nothing to do with Virginia Tech or 9-11. I mean, th th those weren't incidents that were caused by protest signs, for goodness sake. Um, and unshockingly, uh, when, the, uh, when this went to a lawsuit, they lost. Um, I don't think you have to be, I mean, you don't have to be a First Amendment expert to know that they would lose uh, that case. Uh, meanwhile, about 120 miles away, at University of Cincinnati, um, just the summer before, just last summer, uh, another college decided to go into court to defend its free speech zone. The free speech zone that they had on campus was point, point one percent of the entire campus. And you had to get 10 days advance permission, you had to apply 10 days in advance for permission to use that 0.1% of campus. <laughs> yeah. And of, uh, the, the students who were protesting it were, were explaining that they, um, uh, it wasn't enforced across the board, it wasn't across, across fairly, this was a libertarian student group, and they were trying to actually put, uh, get a ballot initiative signed. So I mean, like, this is even frivolous speech. This is actually petitioning the government for redress of grievances. This is specifically enumerated right. But nonetheless, for whatever reason, University of Cincinnati decides it wants to go to court to defend this free speech zone. Just, uh, and no kidding, of course, they, they lost this case. But what scares me is that the university thought it was doing something good by saying that 99.9% .9 of campus was not a non-free speech zone and that students should be forced to get advanced state permission in order to engage in basic free speech activity. So, and then of course we have the problem of speech codes. Um, we've been doing this survey, uh, uh, we've been publishing it since about 2006. We're now up to about 400 colleges where we rate the constitutionality of speech codes on, on college campuses. If it's a private college, we use First Amendment standards because private, uh, because the First Amendment doesn't directly apply to private colleges. Um, but we found that of the top 400 colleges, 62.1% of them maintain codes uh, that would, do not pass constitutional muster. And the red ones are the ones that are way over the line. Uh, the yellow ones are ones that are ambiguous and probably would be overturned by court. The green ones are the only ones that um, are, are totally constitutionally fine. And we've been struggling to increase that, um, that number year by year. And so what do I mean by speech codes? One of my all-time favorites was at Hampton University in New Hampshire which banned psychological intimidation of person or pet. Uh, and also, it, in response to that, one of my other favorite bands, which was first at University of Connecticut, um, and then was defeated in court, and then popped up again years later at Drexel University as if they thought this was a good idea, a ban on inappropriately directed laughter. <laughs> See if you just violated it. Um, I, I find that one particularly amazing because it was specifically defeated at University of Connecticut and specifically a point of derision. Um, and then, then of course, there's, as I mentioned, mentioned at dinner, Florida Gulf Coast University had a code that banned simply expressions deemed inappropriate. <laughs> Which, like, my, my mom's British, so something about that just like, yes, absolutely, inappropriate. That, that will never be allowed. And what I think is so interesting about these codes is they're funny, but we're all guilty of violating them. By their plain language, every man, woman, and child is guilty of violating them. But nonetheless, when we bring these codes to universities' attentions, we get responses from students that like, oh, the administration will do right by that. I'm like, but don't you understand that you're all guilty of violating this by its plain language? And what we see time and time again is that they don't use them that often. But when they do use them, it's the student they don't like, it's the oddball, it's the weirdo, it's the, it's, it's the dissenter, it's the student journalist that's really been getting on their nerves. We've seen a lot of cases like that. So they just sort of wait there um, to be used. Uh, <laughs> Purdue uh, University, by the way, actually does have a, uh, a, a speech code in its IT uh, depart uh, department. I, let's see if I actually have the string. Use of emails that degrades or demeans other individuals. Um, but if you were to get rid of that, that is your one uh, code that would, uh, th that's a red light code. I know it may sound nice, but that's incredibly broad. 
and the, uh, the idea that I, I, I'd be shocked that if any of you in this room has never sent an email that could arguably at least degrade or demean somebody. Um, now, if Purdue were to get rid of that code, though, Purdue would be in a good spot to be a green light school. So it's actually good that you, overall your policies are pretty good, and IT departments going too far is not exactly going to be shocking news to, <laughs> to, to a lot of people out there. So now I want to get to some of, the, some of the tougher cases, some of the ones that, like, I don't want to give the impression that all of this is silly. This is always over, um, over uh, uh, silly issues, because we do have a lot of hot political issues. I will say, however, though, I think that sometimes people think that fire is like sitting on a great pile of like really offensive speech that people, everybody will be horrified by. Truth be told, we have a hell of a lot more cases that are like the Hayden Barnes case um, than we do about ones that when you actually go, oh, I can see how that's offensive. But before I show this next piece of art, um, you should understand that this is in protest of something that, that uh, the, the artist was aware of, that there have been uh, you know, documented attempts both in Palestine, but particularly in Pakistan, of uh, terrorists trying to recruit children to be suicide bombers. Um, he's critical of that. I think you would think everybody would be critical of it, but he's an artist, so he did this. Provocative um, on something uh, that, that he had researched, supposed to be upsetting, supposed to get people's attention. That's the goal of it. But he was made to take down this art and hauled into a professor's class um, and sorry, hauled into to two professors' offices um, and told that he was going to be brought up on charges on hate speech. He asked, well, first of all, he knew that hate speech is not unprotected speech in the U.S., but he asked also why. And he said, this is offensive to all Arabs. And when you think about that, this is clearly anti-terrorism. This is clearly, I think, pretty much uh, most Arabs would agree that you should not be, uh, most Arabs agree that you should not have suicide bombers, period, let alone be recruiting um, kids for it. And so I found it was interesting that the argument was that this was offensive, but the argument that they came up for why it was offensive was actually more offensive than, than arguably the art was. So this is the one that I, that I used to try to illustrate the fact that there's not a hot button issue in the U.S. today that I have not seen someone get in trouble for being on the wrong side of. Um, and that to me, it, if, when you're, if you're wondering, why aren't the students giving their controversial opinions in class? It's like, because they know they can get in trouble, even if it's very far downstream. But I want to, I think a good parallel to this case, though, is this one. This is a Confederate flag, but as you might not be able to see, in the background you have a, a, a depiction of a lynching, you have a Klansman, and this is a professor critiquing the Old South. This is, this is art that he, uh, uh, that, that he did for a display in, in Gainesville State College, saying, uh, being critical of, of the Old South. Now, he would actually had in intended to do a piece of art that uh, would show how other people feel about the, the, the Confederate flag and actually try to have sort of a both sides kind of approach about how, it can, how a symbol can mean different things to different people. But when he had this hanging up, the, uh, I think the Southern Heritage Society um, wrote in, said this is offensive to us and you have to take it down. Now, this is what, what I like to show this one partially because it shows the logical result of where the idea that you have a right not to be offended leads to. Um, and, it, and I think sometimes on campuses, uh, they, they, don't, it, they think it can only be used for causes they would agree with. But, uh, but in this case, you know, he's being critical of racism, he's being critical of the Klan with this one more than anything else. But it's Southern uh, Heritage Society thinks it's offensive. They say, hey, you protect your right not to be offended on campus, so that applies to us too. So all things being fair, the university took this down. And this shows the result of, of, of a right not to be offended. If, you if people really do have a right not to be offended, that reduces everybody to silence. Everybody has an opinion that offends somebody at some point. And as, I, and as I often joke, that being offended is what happens when you have your deepest beliefs challenged. And if you make it through four years of college without ever being offended, you should ask for your money back. So. And now to bring us to the state of American discourse. Um, I know I'm looking at a, at a Hitler poster and laughing, but I'll explain why. If you'll notice that Sarah Palin Hitler, that's George Bush Hitler, that's Barack Obama Hitler, I think that part of the problem with um, clamping down on free speech is it's teaching us, since we're not learning how to debate and discuss, we're resulting to crap like this. 
Um, that, and, and John Stewart did a, great, did a great piece on the lightly accusing people you, you mildly disagree with of being Hitler. And I, I love the, 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 the fact that he said within it, um, it's insulting to people who survived the Holocaust, it's insulting to people who survived the war, it's insulting to history, and most of all, it's insulting to Hitler. He did not try that hard to be that evil just for anybody to be compared to him. But I do think that right now we, we live in a society where it's really easy for us to see people who disagree with us as just the embodiments of societal evil. And I think that colleges could actually be doing, could, could be helping us overcome that to some degree, um, could get us uh, more used to the idea of, of meaningful um, deba uh, debate and discussion. Uh, but it just isn't possible until you reach a point where, where uh, people aren't getting in trouble for having the quote unquote wrong opinion on campus. And which also brings me to this. <laughs> I, I, I love hip hop. I am a huge Kanye fan. I would love to make my own rap video if I could actually put together some rhymes fairly well. And I think that I understood the point. Did, did, did everybody ever familiar with this? I, I assume everybody's familiar with this. They made a, they made a hip hop video trying to, not, uh, make, uh, to talk about how being a, a, an engineering student is cool, and it, it involves, it, you know, they, they rap, it's cute, it's nerd, adorable. Um, it's not, it's like one of the least offensive videos I've seen. It's clear they put a ton of work into it. But someone wrote a, a column for the uh, student newspaper saying about how this represented, um, how this was racist and it represented white. What is the journal? Is it the oh, the Journal and Courier, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, yeah. And uh, about how this w was a sign of, of white, what is the Journal and Courier though? Is it? Oh, it's a local paper. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, wow. Okay. So anyway, and saying that this was white, uh, you know, this is an example of white supremacy, or, or um, and to me, it's kind of like if you really want to have a meaningful debate discussion, if you want to say that you didn't think the video was representative of what students were actually like, then say that. But if you're really going to pull out the big guns and say that this is that this playful video was was an example of everything that's wrong with our society. You, you, people stop listening to you. I, I, I talk about you know the, the, the sort of crying wolf effect. Um, the and the thing that I found funny about this video is that it's new kids on the block, man. Like, like this is that that's what it reminded me the most of. Like that means everything has been completely unacceptable since the 1980s, which is an argument you can make, I guess. Um, so, but so there's different ways in which this harms us. Um, uh, the, the censorship on campus. I think that it. As I said, it encourages us to talk to people already agree with. It allows us to keep out to debate and discussion. It leads to unproductive discussions where we throw around terms that are much, much too overheated lightly, partially because we're only talking within our, with our own people who we get patted on the back for really you know, sticking it to the people we disagree with. And I think this goes for, goes, goes for right, right and left. And it, creates this, it, it turns this environment that could be so much fun, could be for, for debate and discussion, for nerds who love debate and discussion like me. Um, into one where you, it's, it's a risk to really talk about anything. Um, so that's the, that to me is the sort of more subtle um, harm. Um, there's also the, the, the fact that when students are taught, um, uh, I, I was on NPR uh, and there was a student on NPR who was explaining, she was there to defend free speech and she was, we were right on, you know, we were totally agreeing with each other. And then she was asked about how things were, were her, her college. And she said, well, you know, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Um, we have a free speech zone. You have to get 10 days advance notice to use it. But, but they enforce that pretty fairly. And I just like I face palmed. I was just like, no, 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 no. We, you're getting much too used to things. That's, and I have to explain, that's not constitutional. Like, if that's a public, and it wasn't a public college. Like, that, you know, that tiny zone, that would be laughed out, of course. Um, and beyond the legal uh, you know, ramifications of it, it's the teaching people to be, uh, th that it's okay for the government to tell you what you can say, where you can say it, how you can say it. Those aren't the habits of a free people, and those, are the, and those aren't the habits that we should, uh, th 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 those are not habits we should be cultivating. So I think that the, the subtle harm of speech codes and, and of hyper-regulation of speech is teaching people how to think like censors, which scares me. But this is what scares me probably most of all. Uh, turning the censor into the romantic hero. Um, you know, I, I make no bones about it. I'm a Democrat, I'm, I'm pro-choice, um, uh, and, and I'm an atheist. And I, 
if you told me that I would spend a lot of time defending the rights of pro-life students, evangelicals, early in my career, I'd probably be pretty surprised. Um, but how much it needed has been really the surprise. And this case, this is a case where students were protesting, um, uh, the, the, the evangelical Christian students were protesting abortion. Um, they, they believe abortion is murder. They had, a, uh, and they had a display that was approved on campus in a small zone, and they had little white crosses. Um, that was the entire protest. It was approved largely out of the way. And this is Professor Sally Jacobson. She sees this, she goes in front of her class, and she says, I want my, my students to exercise their free speech rights to destroy that display because it offends me. She leads her students out, they destroy the display, and, it's, and, and this, this it wasn't her, she didn't, uh, it, it wasn't that she actually was playing tongue in cheek. When asked afterwards, she really honestly believed that it was, she had a free speech uh, right and duty to destroy speech she disagrees with, to destroy a display because she doesn't like the opinion that it holds, um, which is a complete inversion of what free speech actually means. And what I'm afraid of is that students are learning the message. Um, the censor is the hero in some of these cases. The, this is a free speech wall at Pepperdine University. Free speech walls are this kind of gutsy sociological experiment where you put up a blank piece of paper and you let people write on it and see what happens. And while that may send you know, chills down some people's spine, uh, I've seen a lot of these things and they're generally not anything to be that terrified of. Students swear a lot. <laughs> That shouldn't come as a huge shock, but there's, there, there are some really witty things said on these things sometimes. There's quotes you never heard of. I saw one, I don't want to give you any ideas, but there, someone, someone wrote uh, some, the, the president of the university's salary on one of them. Um, and when people say offensive things on it, people are, you know, it's a free speech wall. You respond on the wall. And the whole experiment is that we can have this and the world does not fall down. And actually, what people are more likely to say is not nearly as bad as you think. Um, so it's a great experiment, but, it, but st students um, and sometimes professors have torn these down. Most recently in a case in Canada at, at University of Toronto where a student tore it down not because of something that it actually said, but because it pre presented the opportunity that something bad could be said. And what scares me about that is that it's an idea that it's not because a lot of people love free speech in, in theory, don't always love it in practice. This is one where the guy didn't even like it in theory. And I'm afraid that that, that, that idea is, is coming, um, becoming much more, uh, more common on campuses where the uh, censor is taking the moral high ground. So overall, you know, um, I, as I get close to the end, I think Alan Charles Coors, who's one of the founders of FIRE, uh, said it perhaps best. A nation that does not educate in liberty will not long endure in liberty and will not even know when it's lost. And that's what we're trying to fight at FIRE. So I gave you more homework than I usually do. Um, so the first thing I ask you is read my book. <laughs> All royalties go to FIRE. I'm not making a penny off of it. Um, spread the word about it. I, think, I, I don't think that censorship on campus needs to be the new normal. Um, I have a, we have a student network. If you sign up, you get a free FIRE t-shirt. They're pretty cool looking. Um, check out your school's policies. I, I, I would love to make Purdue a green light school. It's about this close to being one anyway, so why not? Um, but then there's the, the sort of the deeper stuff. Make it a lifelong habit to seek out smart people with whom you disagree. It's fun, it can be awesome. You, you'll enjoy it later on. Note that the censorship instinct, the desire to grandstand, and the ease with which it, it individuals claim offense. Um, offense really does happen, but if you feed that wolf too much, um, people end up becoming offended at much too low a threshold. Um, and it's, it's good to, and the first step is just observe, observe it and observe it in yourself. So also ask yourself if you are reducing people with whom you disagree to caricature as a societal evil. I have watched this happen on campuses so many times where someone says something that, you know, like off campus you wouldn't think twice about it, but as soon as they say it on campus, I, we had a case that I talked about in the book where someone made a freshman 15 joke, a pretty mild freshman 15 joke, and he was immediately treated as if he was a, a war criminal. And I just don't think that um, uh, that would happen if they remembered, if they practiced what they preach, that, that essentially you have to remember the humanity of everybody you deal with. And then remember that arguments that make us uncomfortable are often the ones we most badly need to have. Um, that's a hard one, but it's true. And just in closing, I've always loved this. Learned Hand, the great American jurist. And always remember the epistemological humility, or as, as, as he better put it, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right.
So, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, r I ran a little late. I think that, I think they're yeah I think that, yeah that's what yeah that's why I, I had to get plugged in so if I got to suffer. <laughs> um, I actually have my name is Soraya. I, um, I'm a reporter for the Exponent. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I got the, the papers wrong. So. Oh no, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Um, well, I mean, we corrected it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I have three relatively quick questions sure. for you. Um, first, so a lot of students are really used to expressing their opinions online rather than physically protesting and actually right. saying what they mean. Um, so how do you think that online social media affects free speech? You know, it, I, I have di different opinions of it. Um, I'm actually the most bullish about Twitter, um, and, and this is why. Um, Twitter, since it limits you to 140 characters, it almost automatically forces the reader to do something that we do too rarely these days. Give the benefit of the doubt and say to yourself, maybe I don't understand what this person is saying. Are they speaking with multiple levels of irony? Are they saying the exact opposite of what they're trying to say? Is this a reference I'm not getting? Is this from Mad Men or something? Like, all these questions that I think people should always be asking themselves. Am I misunderstanding where this person is coming from? Those questions become so obvious and necessary in Twitter that I think in some ways Twitter is actually a good lesson for administrators and for people to one, ask if they're really understanding what people are saying, but also two, to at least in some cases have administrators go, well, I don't know what they're saying, and I can't regulate all of it, so I guess I have to give up on this one. Um, when, it comes to th when it comes to anonymity um, and different aspects of, of the electronic world, I do think that there's, if, you know, like, if comments aren't like, tied to your Facebook account and there's, or, or some sort of like, even pseudonymous pr persona that you've, you've been building up, I think sometimes people can be especially, um, what, what do you call it, nasty, um, because they, they know they'll have no, no personal consequence for that. Um, I do, however, think that we that part of the answer to that, though, is changing a little bit of the way we feel um, about anonymous comments, um, and that essentially, like uh, I wrote a piece about the, these gossip websites that and they, they flare up and then they go away that pe because people write really horrible things on the gossip websites and then people stop reading the gossip websites because it's not like we gave tremendous uh, credit to the, the you know the the. Uh, the accuracy of what people used to scrawl on, 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 on bathroom walls. And that's basically what anonymous comments on the internet should be regarded as, essentially. So I think, it's, I think overall I see it as a positive. I've definitely seen more people get in trouble for what they say on Facebook th than for Twitter, though. Um, thank you. My next question is, where do you draw the boundary between respect and um, expressing your opinion? Mm -hmm. I think ultimately respect works. Um, but you have to let people come to their own conclusion on that. Um, I think that, that ultimately, because it's one of these things, like people talk about, um, you know, uh, the, being polite and being respectful and all this kind of stuff, and, and the civility. But we all have an issue where if you put it right in our face, I will not have to be civil about this. You know, I'm not going to have to, you know, say nice things about, you know, my dad grew up in Nazi-occupied Yugoslavia. I mean, like, I, I don't have to be nice about what everybody thinks about whether or not, um, you, you know, Slavs are untermensch. It, um, we all have things where, where we understand that we don't always need to be, need to be civil. I, at the same time, though, I, you know, I do believe that being civil is effective in a lot of different cases. I think it, it's better, sometimes better at getting your message heard. But if we were all civil, think, just think about what that would do to humor. <laughs> so it's got, it's got its place, it's got its validity, and some people could use more of it. But I think sometimes when we, when, when we wish for a, a much more civil society, we, al we also should forget, it's important to remember that we also might be wishing for a less lively one, too. Um, my final question is, what is your quick definition of um, free speech? Hmm? My quick definition of free speech? Good, my goodness. An anarchical epistemological system based on, um, I, I, yeah, actually, it's, it's kind of funny. I was saying it with my funny voice, and I realized, oh, that's actually pretty close to what I, what, what I, what I think of it as. Um, I think that it's probably best um, explained as uh, what Jonathan Rauch called liberal science, um, which it involves two primary rules, which is that no argument is ever truly over. It's a little bit of Buddhist stuff that, that jives with me, too. Um, and that nobody gets to call um, special, uh, special unquestioned authority. And that does not mean that people aren't authorities. That doesn't mean that people aren't professors. 
but it means that they can't say, I'm, well, I'm the head priest of Zeus, so this is now objective truth here and forever from now on. And that's the, the, the kind of uh, what, what Rauch called the liberal science idea, was that it's, it is an anarchical system. It's like democracy. It's like, uh, it's like uh, free market systems, um, where the idea is that you, by doing a minimum of trying to control it, you actually produce, produce greater things. So uh, my, my somewhat bookish answer is that free speech is liberal science. But, but the interesting thing about that is that liberal science is the larger Boolean circle around which scientific method is just a small part. Um, scientific method by its, and it's funny because people I think do it the wrong way. They think scientific method was the big innovation and that free speech is just some sort of like cousin of scientific method. But it, it, you know, in, in my opinion, I, I'd love to write a book about this. Really the, the liberal science idea is this larger idea of how we debate, decide debate. Whereas scientific method is this much more disciplined uh, systemic application of doubt. Thank you, sir. Sure. Hi, my name is Kirsten. I'm also from the student newspaper, The Exponent. Um, I was editor in chief last year, and we ran into a situation where we ran a letter to the editor that was uh, homophobic. Mm -hmm. It just said uh, negative things about um, the LGBTQ community at Purdue. And we got a lot of backlash for it. Yeah. Um, from one of, one of the people that wrote the white supremacy uh, guest column wrote a response. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to decide how I wanted to respond to all the controversy, and there was a petition and all sorts of things. So I guess um, my question is, what is the responsibility of student newspapers on, on campus? Um, what is their responsibility in sort of guiding the conversation? And right. Because I could have just as easily not run the letter yeah. and run it. So how do you make that decision? That, 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 that's a terrific question. And, and like, like a lot of First Amendment people, um, my background was I was international relations but also journalism as an undergrad. And if anything gets you really radicalized about First Amendment, it's doing journalism. Because you get to see firsthand, if someone knows a rationale for shutting you up, they learn it quickly and they apply it to student journalists first. And it's creepy how quickly people get that. Um, now, with regards to the responsibility of the student press, it, it is funny. Like, we, we, people will still write fire, you know, sometimes saying, um, you know, I was a conservative or a liberal columnist and I wrote this column and then the, the student newspaper fired me, help me. And we'll sort of go, no, we'd be on the paper side. It, it, it's the paper's independence is, it, is, it, is where the right actually lays with. Now, if the university intervened and made the student newspaper against its will fire, uh, the columnist. That's a completely different thing, and that's a case fire would be involved in. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're a big believer in, in, in the independence of, of, of the student press. Um, when it comes to responsibility, it, you know, it, it is one of those things about, uh, you know, discernment and discussion. I do think that um, guiding, being bold, though, it, it, it is a risky, uh, is a risky tack that not a lot of student journalists are willing to take these days, and I do think that they cave too, too easily. And I do think that sometimes people, you know, it's, I wrote about this for Twitter, uh, on, on, uh, about Twitter um, on CNET this past weekend, um, you know, and I hinted at it before, maybe mentioned it, that there's an informational value in knowing what people actually think. I mean, I'm, I'm very pro-gay rights, I'm not religious, but it's helpful to know, for example, that, uh, uh, that different Muslims, that different Orthodox Jews, that different Christians believe it's sinful. Um, and, it, and, you, and it's not helpful to pretend that that's not an actual belief. So, and having that discussion is going to get people angry. They're going to say, this is hate speech, but it's better that you know what people actually think than, than try to hide it. Um, that being said, kind of like what, your edit uh, what the editorial responsibility is, trying to get something that will actually meaningfully foster discussion and then standing by it. Um, I think that universities, and fi FIRE defends student newspapers that you know, get in trouble for April Fool's um, editions. Uh, because we believe in satire and parody, but I'm also sympathetic to some degree with the Student Press Law Center, which is my, pretty much my second favorite nonprofit out there, when they say, don't do uh, April Fool's editions, because would a real newspaper do an April Fool's edition? And they make the professionalism argument, which um, you know, goes beyond sort of the, the idea of freedom of speech. I think, though, fo fostering um, good debate and discussion um, is something that, that y y papers can really serve a really vital function. And I think also, administration should understand, and I, and I talk a lot about this in the book, that sometimes they try to turn student newspapers into sort of organs of the, uh, of the administration, and they don't get that one of the things they're losing is you actually have independent reporting at a student newspaper. Sometimes they can point out problems that the, the, the university president, the university administration is not gonna find out about otherwise. 
but it, 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 it's a you know it's a very interesting and there's no simple or easy answer but it's you know go ahead and uh, and don't and don't back down too easily um, it, 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 if you think that there's a there's a value in people knowing what some people what, what other people think even if you think that opinion is wrong Joey. hi I I appreciated your presentation. Uh, I want to say a few things and ask about uh, whether fire has been involved in these. Uh, as you know, historically, obviously, the university, like all institutions, are political institutions, and they're subject uh, to a whole variety of political pressures and forces. Uh, the American University, particularly in the period of the Cold War since World War II, right. has been significantly impacted in terms of the substance of what's taught, right. the paradigms that dominate individual fields, uh, what faculty feel they're allowed to teach, right. and the kind of discourse they can have in the classroom. Ellen Trecker wrote a fascinating, depressing book called No Ivory Tower mm -hmm. about the purging of faculty in the 1950s because of their prior political associations or forms, petitions. Because Mar Mar Marjorie Hines just wrote a book about yeah. that, too. Yeah. Um, and more recently, in 2005, David Horowitz, who has some currency uh, on, on the right, yeah. published a book uh, called The 101 Most Dangerous Professors. Mm -hmm. And he tried to encourage student groups to uh, lobby state legislatures to develop uh, criteria for recruitment of faculty. Right. I'm, and I'm the impact of all that stuff has uh, you know, led, in some cases, to alums pr uh, tr trying to pressure administrators to uh, fire you know, faculty who you know, make the 101 list and so right. on and so forth, so that part of the uh, part of the uh, threat uh, to academic freedom comes from political forces like this, right. and it's got a long history in this right. country. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there's an awful lot to unpack. I, I, um, we just uh, had one of our staffers write actually a review from Marjorie Hines' book um, talk, and talking about parallels today. I, I, I wanted to interrupt just on the David Horowitz thing because I found it uh, kind of funny what the result, results of the 101 professors was, though is that a lot of the professors who made it onto the 101 list uh, were very proud of the fact that they had made it onto 101. Yeah. So it, did, it didn't really work. Um, the, when, they, when, when there was the, the push for Horowitz's Academic Bill of Rights, um, you know, the only thing that you know, FIRE added to it was the fact that we want to get rid of university speech codes, which has always been our position. We think universities should not have speech codes. And we certainly have had, we defend professors as well, um, and definitely, when watching the weird kind of ebb and flow with which a, a professor can suddenly um, get into the public point of view and, and generate public ire, um, like you know, a, a serious case that certainly didn't win us any friends. Probably my first letter was right after 9/11, and it was a professor uh, uh, Richard Berthold at University of New Mexico, who's and this is a guy who's known people love his class because he has an irreverent sense of humor. Uh, but it, it, you know, it's a joke in poor taste. But he said, anybody who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. And they immediately, and you know, this is typical with a sense of humor, poor taste. He apologized uh, profusely. Um, but what was interesting was that he decided that he wasn't going to, he wanted to just settle with the university and just, um, and didn't want to fight it out. And I remember having this conversation with him, saying, listen, I know you think it's safer not to actually. Because you, you, you've already apologized. That's already you, you're on record for saying that, and you should follow your conscience on um, on whether or not you want to apologize. But they're going to try to get you out of school now. And with, by the summer, he was out, but, but he wasn't actually willing to fight it. And it's it's I, it, it's interesting that if in those situations where university professors sometimes think that they should be pulling back and hiding, that if they actually are more out in front, they're a lot safer. Um, they're they're uh, they're a lot safer from uh, from from harm. Uh, Greg, one of the biggest weapons that I think is used in censorship is the uh, the concept of confidentiality. Oh, sure, yeah. And I wonder if you would comment on that because I think that that's one of the things that maybe students and professors find somewhat egregious because. Um, they have no comeback when everything's confidential. Yep. 
And uh, it's, it's a big game that's yep. really played, I would say, more at the middle level yep. of administration than anywhere else. Yeah. Could you comment on yeah, that? that? That's great. Uh, just conceptually, I, I think of confidentiality and censorship as, as, diff as sometimes related but different concepts. Um, but definitely, does, does excessive demands of confidentiality create serious problems potentially for also academic freedom, um, but also what's called um, uh, intramural speech? The ability to, uh, one of the parts of academic freedom that I think is underappreciated, um, and, and I think you know, for, under, for some understandable reasons, um, is that universities are supposed to be places that include different elements of academic freedom, including uh, an unusual for something that's otherwise sort of a corporation or um, to be able to point out problems within the institution and to be able to complain about it. That, and that's what intramural speech means, the ability to say this things aren't running right and professors should have unusual freedom um, unlike a regular employee to be able to, to, uh, to talk about that. Um, and I've seen an awful lot of cases over the years. And in, in the book Higher Education, question mark, by Claudia Dreyfus and Andrew Hacker, they talk about their, them just not seeing too many abuses of academic freedom over the years because they weren't including intramural, uh, intramural cases. And, and right now I'm dealing with a case that obviously I can't say where or who, but it is a case where it's a pretty egregious one. Um, and he wrote an op-ed that would have, uh, you know, I could have placed pretty prominently. And at the last minute, he decided he wasn't going to do it because he realized he would get prosecuted for, a, for a confidentiality violation because it was this big to do. And the university decided to solve it by saying, we're basically going to put this in a file. And you're, everybody's you know, unilaterally, you know, it, 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 confidentiality is imposed on everybody. And since I couldn't tell him that there was no chance that he'd be retaliated against, and I couldn't say that. I, I, I was just recommending that he actually fight. He wasn't able to bring this pretty egregious injustice to, to light. So uh, I think a, a particularly interesting um, example of, of confidentiality, where confidentiality has gone wrong too, is at University of North Carolina, where it was a situation where a student um, was part of a, 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 she'd accused another student of sexual assault. Um, and then uh, she felt like the, uh, the whole process uh, was hor horrifyingly uh, skewed against her. And she didn't name the student. She didn't explain. Um, she didn't say uh, say who it was. But she complained about the process. And because she publicly complained about the process, she was uh, found guilty under the university honor code because that was basically a breach of confidentiality. Um, and that's that's all going on right now. So I, I think that I think that it's kind of like what's going on, you know, both in the, in the Bush and the Obama administration. Um, was that you don't have to worry so much about links if you make every single thing in the world confidential. Um, and I think that, you know, that universities are, are unfortunately taking a little, a little lesson from that, which, is, which can be great from their point of view for keeping, keeping uh, uh, dirty laundry out, out, out from uh, public view, but it can be a nightmare for people who are bound by it. Is this a good question? Yeah. Hi. I'm Daniel Gless. I'm um, a freshman in the engineering department, and I'm going into biological engineering, and I'm here with Young Americans for Liberty. And I want to ask you about this. One thing that I think is somewhat of a problem is that basically the sort of Alinsky tactics of dehumanizing the opponent is sort of used and is kind of permeated throughout the campus in what many would describe essentially as the, the political correctness scheme to essentially silence those who would have unpopular viewpoints because essentially those viewpoints have become shot down essentially as being insert ad hominem attack here mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. Um, what do you think or know of this? What, what was the last part? Um, what what do you know about this issue, basically, and what do you think of it? Um, the, the <laughs> um, I, I think that we use a lot of cheap tactics to shut down debate and discussion, and I think that campuses um, are overindulged in that. Um, I think that uh, you know sometimes there are arguments that sound a little silly, um, but we should at least try to hear them out. Um, but I think we're much too quick to uh, grandstand, much too quick to point fig fingers, much too quick to um, characterize people like we disagree with as some kind of embodiment of societal evil. Um, so it's something that I do see, and I think it makes campuses um, less fun and less open than they otherwise should be. Any more? 
Maybe I'll have the, the, the last question for you, Greg. <laughs> in, in your book, you talk about the role of publicity in yes. making things public and how powerful yep. a tool that is. Could you kind of expand on, on, on kind of that strategy? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and this after complaining about the fact that the Chronicle of Higher Education doesn't like to cover me. Um, the, other than that, though, um, it, our cases are pretty, they're often pretty ridiculous. And the, the benefit of that is that, you know, you give these sometimes to reporters and they go, really? And they end up being these, you know, meaty cases in the LA Times or the Wall Street Journal or, um, or for that matter, just in the blogosphere. Um, so publicity is essential because sometimes things are more wrong than they are illegal. Um, like speech, speech zones. Speech zones make everybody in the country angry, um, other than the administrators who establish them. Like when, when, they, when they hear about them, they go, that's ridiculous. Uh, meanwhile, the actual state of the law is that you're allowed, it, it's pretty unclear the extent to which you're allowed time, place, and manner restrictions. So not, you're gonna lose on all the speech zones I've talked about here. That, that, that they're much too easy, they're, they're jokes. Uh, courts don't take them seriously. But other ones that are probably unreasonable could potentially pass legal muster, but they don't stand up very well to public, uh, public ridicule, nor do universities. Um, I find this really funny though, that, that, that fire, I think we have this, you know, like we're tough and we're, we're watchdogs, but our strategy is we send universities a letter, we give them a chance to back down, and then we take it public and then they start getting calls from alums and donors and, and that's usually when they back down. But I've always been amazed that they know who we are by now. Why don't they just back down when we send them the letter? Like when we, when we do the press release where, where a university came to its senses, we're downright nice. Like we write it going, oh, it's, we're glad to see the university is, you know, came, to, came to its senses in this case. Um, but pub publicity is absolutely essential. Uh, partially to, to also, and it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, is just to remind people that this involves real people. You know, some of these cases are funny, but at the same time, it's also someone whose uh, academic career is being ruined for something that they have a constitutional right to do. And that's something that you can't let people forget. <laughs>